this statue represents the oppression of black people. <laughs> How does a black man kneeling at a white man's feet? Are we supposed to be saying, oh, thank you, master, okay. for saving us? Oh, my goodness. He's in shackles. He's not even clothed. Where the magnanimous emancipator Abraham Lincoln is showed standing above him, well dressed with his arm extended. How are you going to represent black people looking free when you have them kneeling before a white man? What imagery does that teach our young children about our history? And what does it teach them moving forward in terms of achieving their liberation and freedom on their own terms? Breaking the shackles is Lincoln's actions and his history. We need to not hide history. Are you angry? Yes. You will hear us. You will hear us. You will hear us. Monuments have been around for thousands of years. They are created to commemorate a person or significant historical event intended to speak to generations not yet born, to document what mattered to the monument's creators. The Emancipation Monument has stood in Lincoln Park since its installation on Capitol Hill April 14, 1876, the 11th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. When Charlotte Scott, a freed woman from Virginia, learned of Lincoln's assassination, she declared that the colored people had lost a great friend and should raise a monument to his memory. It would be a fitting show of respect and appreciation for the martyred president who signed the Emancipation Proclamation January 1st, 1863, freeing persons held as slaves in the rebellious states. From the very beginning, the project was intended to be funded entirely by Black Americans. John Mercer Langston, a prominent Black public servant and attorney, was involved in the effort to raise needed funds from Black Americans that took him across the country and succeeded. He and Frederick Douglass, orators, statesmen, and abolitionists were both on the installation ceremony planning committee. The significance of newly emancipated Americans creating something tangible and lasting was front and center in the minds of those whose donations made the monument a reality. Joseph T. Wilson, a Black Union soldier who became a leader in Black politics and writer after the war, wrote extensively about the statue. There are those, perhaps, who may think that some other form of testimonial, such as the endowment of some great charity, would be better. But the colored people of the United States, and especially the liberated bondsmen, wish something tangible and visible to the eye of present and future that will testify of their love and gratitude to their great deliverer. Douglas delivered the oration at the dedication ceremony that had over 20,000 attendees, many if not most of them black. He drew attention to the fact that this monument was a historic first. The first time Black Americans have been given the opportunity to contribute to the country's monument landscape. When President Ulysses S. Grant, who was given the honor of removing the covering, revealed the monument, the image of President Lincoln and the emancipated man came into view. The crowd erupted into cheers that lasted for several minutes. For Douglas, this monument erected in the heart of America within view of the Capitol was sending an important message to all of America.
black and white. We, the colored people, newly emancipated and rejoicing in our blood-bought freedom, have now and here unveiled, set apart, and dedicated the monument of enduring granite and bronze in every line, feature, and figure of which the men of this generation may read, and those of after coming generations may read something of the exalted character and great works of Abraham Lincoln, the first martyr president of the United States. Charlotte Scott, by then in her 70s, was also in attendance that spring day. She, who dared to propose the grand idea of a monument to honor Mr. Lincoln, demonstrated her commitment by giving her first five dollars earned in freedom as seed money towards its installation. The plaque on the base of the monument beneath the word emancipation has only two names, Abraham Lincoln and Charlotte Scott. This monument, therefore, not only honors Abraham Lincoln, but also celebrates the commitment and character of Charlotte Scott and cements her place in history. She is likely the first woman in American history to initiate a national monument prominently installed on federal land. All this at a time when women, white, and even more so black, had little agency and were unlikely to receive public recognition for their achievements. A monument by its very nature is fixed in time and space. Douglas noted this monument's limitations. He said it does not tell the whole truth and acknowledged that no one monument could be made to tell the whole truth of any subject it might be designed to illustrate. What truth did this monument attempt to illuminate? And why has it evoked such heated discussions as of late? Emancipation, that singular word on the base suggests action taking place. Lincoln holds in his right hand the Emancipation Proclamation, the official document that freed slaves in rebellious states. As Douglas said earlier, much blood was shed before freedom was nationwide. This other man portrayed in the monument is not just some generic figure, but is based on Archer Alexander, an actual former slave, whose heroic actions saved the lives of Union soldiers and hastened his own freedom. This moment, this moment of transition, frozen in time and space in this artifact, is the moment of emancipation. Let's take a closer look at the two figures and then examine not only the more apparent elements, but the often overlooked symbols that when understood, expand the history telling as well. Some see the figure as kneeling before a white man, crouching at Lincoln's feet or worse, shining his shoes. But others of the day saw him in the process of rising. Langston was at the unveiling. When describing the statue, he noted that the figure, a slave, is rising. He continued. He is represented as just rising from the earth while his face is lighted with joy as he anticipates the full manhood of freedom. One hand is knuckles curled pressing downward, looks like a runner pushing off, getting ready to sprint. This figure is not resigned to an unjust state, but demonstrating the vigorous action to take his rightful place among free men. His shoulder and arm muscles embody strength and resolve. Though a shackle remains on his raised hand, he firmly grips the broken chain that no longer can hold him. Now, 
Let's compare the Emancipation Monument to other contemporary statues and their use of similar imagery. Let's start with Lifting the Veil of Ignorance by Charles Keck, installed in 1922 on the grounds of Tuskegee University. Here we see Booker T. Washington, a former slave himself, lifting the veil of ignorance that once covered the black man, shown clutching a book representing education, a right that was denied him by law. Once Washington, who understood the importance of education, gained his own freedom, he determined to help others get an education too. The figure, bare chest and bare foot, symbolic of his former enslaved state, emerges from beneath the veil of imposed ignorance, his eyes looking up and forward to a future made brighter through education. Then there's a the broken chain. As a symbol of freedom, it was later adopted and used on the Statue of Liberty, the gift from France meant to celebrate the Union victory and the abolition of slavery. There too, the broken chain lies at the feet of Lady Liberty to show slavery has no place in this land. Another complaint is how differently the two are dressed. Quote, the magnanimous emancipator Abraham Lincoln is shown standing above him well-dressed, end quote. Lincoln was over six feet tall, which would certainly accentuate the visual proximity. As to how Lincoln is dressed, he is president of the United States, so it makes sense for him to be dressed fitting his office. Looking at how the rising figure is positioned, if his action was fully executed, he would stand up. Some analysts suggest if he stood up, he would be around the same height as Lincoln. So what we have here is a man caught in mid-action. His gaze is upward toward the heavens. A man of faith, grateful for divine deliverance and hopeful for the future. He's not even clothed, calls out one disgruntled from the crowd that gathered at the monument the summer of 2020. Frederick Douglass, in his oration at the monument's dedication, acknowledged how, as he put it, Our brave sons and brothers lay off the rags of bondage and were clothed all over in the blue uniforms of the soldiers of the United States. Douglass understood the rags as a symbol of enslavement was shed for the blue uniform as a symbol of self-agency, ready, willing, and able to fight for their freedom. Now let's take a closer look at the arrangement of other elements and some overlooked symbols that expand its history telling. Lincoln's hand rests on top of a plinth consisting of a column on a base. In his hand, He's holding the partially unrolled proclamation. Under his hand are two books. It is believed one is the Bible and the other possibly the Constitution. Just below this, around the top of the plinth, are stars representing the states. A profile of George Washington, the first elected president of the United States, is flanked on each side by what are called facies, which is Latin for a bundle. A facie is a tied bundle of wooden rods that sometimes include an ax with a blade showing like we see here. It symbolizes collective power, law, and governance. To the right of Washington is a shield that has 13 stars and stripes for the original 13 colonies. On his left is a blank shield. Around the base of the plinth or column are 13 stars for the original colonies. On the base of the column on one side is the name of the American sculptor Thomas Ball, 
1874. On another face is the name of the foundry located in Munich, Germany, where it was cast. Before we leave the front of the monument, let's take a look behind us to the east at the monument dedicated to Mary McLeod Bethune. Just as the Emancipation Monument owes its existence to a woman of vision, Charlotte Scott, the Bethune Monument stands because the National Council for Negro Women, founded by Ms. Bethune, advocated and raised the funds for its creation and installation. Bethune, a daughter of former slaves, was born in 1875, one year before the Emancipation Monument's installation. Her extraordinary life as a civil rights leader and educator was the realization of freedom's promise written in the proclamation held in Lincoln's hand. The council intended the new monument to be in dialogue with the Emancipation Monument. They recognized the significance of this park where thousands of newly emancipated citizens gathered in 1876 to honor President Lincoln and where important civil rights gatherings occurred in the years after. As it was not seemly for Lincoln to have his back to this esteemed lady, the Emancipation Monument was rotated 180 degrees so they could be face to face. Lincoln and Archer Alexander could now witness the hard won progress Ms. Bethune represented. Now we come to the back of the group. Most visitors to the monument are so focused on the front, they tend to neglect or overlook the back where so much more meaning is included. Looking at the back of the arrangement, behind Archer is the remaining stump of a pillory or whipping post that has been chopped down, making it impotent. The attached ring once held a chain used to restrain a victim. Both are now encircled by a rose vine, signaling they will no longer be put to their former use. Notice the ball with a broken link and broken whip. More symbols of control and brutality no longer fit for use. A draped cloth has been used on gravestones to stand for the protective nature of God over the dead and their remains until the resurrection. On the other side behind Lincoln is a pierced heart, which may suggest how slavery struck at the heart of what was at the time a still young nation, and by its rear positioning meant slavery is and must be put behind us, but not to be forgotten, lest it be repeated. There you have it. All in all, there is much more on the monument than a casual glance will record. The next time you visit, keep these symbols in mind as you walk around and see it from all sides. John Bircher, author of Ways of Seeing, reminds us, we only see what we look at, to look is an act of choice.